All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Phyllis Quinlan, who is in New York City. How are you doing, Phyllis? I'm fine, John. How are you? Excellent. And um, uh, Dr. Quinlan has practiced nursing as a staff nurse, educated nurse executive and internal coach in a variety of clinical settings. And now you have a full service consulting firm established in 1994 that does executive coaching, leadership development and personal coaching. But what we wanted to talk today about was your new bo your book, uh, Bringing Shadow Behavior into the Light. Um, so first of all, um, uh, let's get let's get into it. So understanding and effectively managing bullying and incivility in in healthcare. So let me just ask you, Phyllis, what was the genesis of this, and why did you feel the need to write this book in the first place? Um, really, the genesis came out of not only my personal experiences, but the um, onslaught of stories and challenges that people who I were co I was coaching were coming up to me and speaking about and you know, sharing their instances, looking for guidance, trying to figure out how to navigate something that truly they couldn't see the light of day for this, and really talking about their experiences and the difficulties they were have in many in, in bringing this to the attention of leadership. That you know, uh, there was always this person's behavior, the person who was doing the bullying always had some plausible excuse, plausible deniability around that behavior that put the person who was trying to, you know, escalate uh, disruptive behavior appropriately more in the bad light than the person actually, you know, participating in that disruptive behavior. And then, you know, as, as I got into uh, my a nurse executive, you know, situation, certainly I would hear that from staff members. And, you know, after being a nurse for 42 years, it's hard to, you know, navigate that kind of a, you know, a career without being on the on the receiving end of at least some incivility, let alone bullying. Mm -hmm. And do you think, uh, I mean, obviously this goes on in all different uh, professions and, and that, but um, was there anything particular to healthcare? Well, it's funny you say that, John, because, you know, there's a, there's an old joke, you know, why do people rob banks? That's where the money is. Um, what I've decided or what I've come actually have, you know, come to the conclusion is that, you know, with the disruptive behavior, you have somebody who's chronically uncivil. They're more annoying, disruptive, juvenile, low emotional intelligence. And then you have somebody who's really a bully. And I describe them as a narcissist with a license. And, mm. you know, when you need to um, have people try to understand you and work with you and try to help you correct and shine light on your disruptive behavior with the intention of coaching. And if I put some leadership effort into this person, they're going to see the light and it's going to change them. They're going to be a productive member of the department. If you need that type of nurturing, caregiving personality to always extend the finish line and never truly hold you accountable, mm -hmm. what better place to go to than healthcare? Yeah, yeah, no, that that's that's really that's really fascinating and very interesting, and uh, and and part of it is too is we're, we have obviously such high regard for people in in the healthcare professions, um, and I presume when people come into that profession, not having been in myself, I'm just making assumptions. I mean, you come in with an enormous amount of respect for the people who have been there, the people who, who, are, who have the experience and the credentials and all of that. So it probably in some ways, you probably excuse a lot of behavior right out of the gate just because you're so respectful. Well, well you are. And, you know, you, 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 you're trying to, there, there is this overtone of you have to pay your dues. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you want to, you know, um, you know, uh, put up with certain things and people will actually tell you, you know, uh, stay away from Phyllis, you know, um, or keep your head down and just do your job. You know, uh, she's not the easiest person, but you're going to learn a lot. So <laughs> you to expect to be somewhat abused, uncivil, you know, have, have some uncivil behavior come your way, but they justify it with, but keep your mouth closed and your eyes open and you're going to learn a lot, going to get a great orientation as if that, condones it. 
The good side of this, John, though, is that in my travels mm -hmm. across the country, talking to, to nursing leadership, we really decided that about 85 to 90 percent of the people who are our, who make up our staff members are really coming to work looking to do world class care and yeah. act in a collegial manner. It is a 10 to 15 percent group. The larger portion of that 15 percent indulges in chronic uncivil behavior with maybe only three to five percent of people actually indulging in what I call narcissistic bullying behavior. Yeah, and I guess so. I mean, that is good news, but I guess also the struggle is to some degree, Phyllis, is that we live in a society and a culture today that celebrates narcissism. I mean, it's almost like, I mean, it seems to be, uh, you know, we, we love it and we, we, people aspire to, I oh, wish I had that like sense of, you know, where people confuse it a sense of confidence or whatever, when it's really narcissism. So um, I guess that's the only downside is that there, there's a pervasive culture that actually celebrates this kind of behavior. So I'm not going to say there wasn't. And, you know, 40 years ago when I started practicing, you know, we were trying to develop the pr profession of nursing from something mm -hmm. that was the handmaiden of the physician to something that was then, you know, moving out of the hospital, going into the academic setting. You know, we finally got baccalaureate degrees and then we went on to master's degrees and 4% of us actually are prepared at the doctorate level now. Um, the, you know, that took a little effort. That took a little, you know, you, you, you couldn't be lovely and demand your, your, your rights at the mm -hmm. same time, you know. So, so people had this kind of harshness and tone to it. But that's not what's happening now. We, we're, we're less transactional and far more transformational. We realize that we need to engage our staff. And, and, and to be very honest with you, when we were you know, probably in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s, when there was such a small proportion of nursing nurses and especially nurse leaders that had maybe a baccalaureate degree and were thinking about master's degrees. That was a small proportion of nurses. That is not so today. Most nurses are coming out prepared, at least at the baccalaureate level, and are getting a master's within several years of practice. So we have, you have to develop a temperament and an understanding that you, as a leader, will be leading leaders, that you, your staff will be almost as equally prepared, maybe not experientially, but definitely academically, as you are. It changes everything, and we're far more, we should be, uh, far more inclusive, far more engaging, far more leaders who make other leaders as opposed to leaders who create followers. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's also it's very interesting because, um, as you know, traditionally, if you think leadership or people's perception of leadership is that you should be the one to know everything and you should have the most experience and all of that. But we know that in, in all in pretty much all jobs today, there's so many specializations and, and things that need that you can never be that. And, and not that you ever could be in the first place, but you certainly can't be that right now. And that you have to you have to gather people around you and you have to celebrate their expertise. And I guess that's probably in, in healthcare, probably it has been a transition for some people because let's face it, I mean, we have, we often put, um, you know, doctors and healthcare professionals up on pedestals. Right. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say we're not guilty of acting in our own sense of silos too. You know, mm -hmm. doctors do this and yeah. advanced care practitioners do this and nurses do this. And then, of course, we have the non-licensed staff um, that is, you know, invaluable. But, you know, I, if, if 2020 showed us anything, John, it's that we're going to live and die by our relationships and we are going to, you know, we are far greater. We're a far greater force for good when we work together, there's a, there's a far deeper appreciation for what everybody brings to the team, regardless of academic status, license, skill, certification, that we could not have gotten through 2020 and the challenges without relying on each other, which is mm. now the reason why a healthy work environment is essential. Yeah, and, and I think on top of that, uh, as well, I, I agree with you, Phil. On top of that, if you think about the changing nature of work, and even the fact that um, even even in the healthcare professions, like a lot more of the work would be done virtually and online, you know, where you have uh, uh, as opposed to everything being done in person. So it it actually increases the skill set that's needed, 
but also it increases the need for teamwork, I think, and for and for having everybody on the same page and gathering around a team, because if you're going to operate in hybrid environments and stuff and still service, you know, your, your patients, etc., you need to have a very well oiled machine. I, I couldn't agree more. And we need to now have I, I feel the secret sauce for all of this is really developing emotional intelligence. And <clears throat> prior to this, we put a tremendous amount of emphasis on academic knowledge and skill preparation. And I'm, I drank all the Kool-Aid. I went, you know, and got a doctorate and had certifications and all of that. And I'm here to say that it's not enough. You know, it may have been at one point, but we're realizing now to, that to create the best possible safe, engaging care regimen for the patient, um, we really need to develop our emotional intelligence skills for two reasons, not only to have a far more authentic connection with our patients, but emotional intelligence is, for me, the foundation of resilience, which is going to lower the risk for caregiver burnout. Yeah, um, I, I, and I, I could see that, and I'm sure, I mean, caregiver burnout is obviously a, is a major issue, and obviously, probably particularly over the last while, but it is interesting what you just said there about the uh, the emotional intelligence and the connection with the patients, because I do think this was starting to happen pre-pandemic. I think people were already starting to to sort of the pendulum was swinging back and people were starting to need more of a connection and real connection with people as opposed to everything being technology, like technology supporting, but not being the the tip of the spear, if you like. And I think that's only been exacerbated, obviously, during because of the pandemic crisis. So I think that the point that you just made there, that ability to have good emotional intelligence and being able to relate to patients differently is, is critical. It is. And you, 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 there's data to show that, you know, um, we, we all um, have a boss and we all get a report card. And of course, mm -hmm. healthcare organizations use patient satisfaction scores and we take them very, very seriously. And you know, a lot of those questions are around, did you feel that you were being heard? Did you feel that you were yeah. being listened to? Did you feel that, you know, um, your questions were being respected and answered fully? These, these are all data points that reflect the emotional intelligence of the caregiver team that you encountered, not just one person, but the team. Yeah. And so therefore that, uh, getting back to what we were talking about there, that puts a lot more onus on on leadership to create and nurture that kind of environment. So therefore, if you are, if you are, shall we say, of the old school or of the not very positive approach to it, uh, you're not going to be able to build that team around you. And you're certainly, and to be honest, people have a lot of choice nowadays, especially here in the US, you're going to, your people, your patients are going to go elsewhere. And there's high competition for that. That's right. But yeah. also your practitioners, you're going to bleed talent. And I don't care if you're yeah. in healthcare, or you're, you're, you know, doing anything else in any other kind of, you know, venue where you rely on having the best pe people as part of your team. If you don't create that healthy work environment and you don't fully understand that a strong emotional intelligence is the secret ingredient for not only your staff member being solid, um, but for your workplace being healthy. Um, then you, you, you can bleed through quite a bit of recruitment and retention budget money until you actually figure that out. Yeah. And I, and I think the other thing, too, sometimes when, when people hear things like this, sometimes they think, oh, well, the answer is just a very softly, softly approach and all of that kind of stuff. But at the same time, it's not really. I mean, you still what you still want to demand like um, high performance. You want to demand that people like do their jobs to the best of their abilities and all of that. So I think sometimes those things get conflated because people don't understand. They think, oh, I better create a very, a, a lovely warm environment where we, we never say anything mean to each other or we don't point out things and we kind of like dance around issues. That's not the answer either, right? Well, you know, as a leader, you have to be a little bit mindful. And um, one of the things I point out in the book is that you have to understand the the mentality of a narcissist in order to tool up academically to understand how they think, because it's very aberrant from the 85 to 90 percent of the rest of us who go into healthcare as a profession. So one of the leading things that you'll find with people who engage in bullying or intimidating behavior for their own enjoyment at the expense of someone else who's getting targeted is that they are usually quite bright, 
and they are very skilled. And we rely upon that knowledge and skill a lot, maybe too much. So they feel that they can always lean over the edge and push the edge of the envelope of behavior, appropriate behavior, because after all, last thing you want to do is get rid of your strongest person and they mm -hmm. leverage that. And, you know, again, you take that person and you use them to orient somebody new and you, you literally apologize ahead of time. Listen, <laughs> it's be tough and she's going to give you, you know, but you're going to get a great orientation. You know, the fact that you're going to come out of there bleeding is just a little, you know, uh, you know, price you have to pay. It's silly, but this is actual stuff that, that we do as opposed to bringing this person and saying to them, you have fabulous knowledge and fabulous skills. Um, but, you know, from a personality point of view and from a civility uh, point of view and from your ability not just to engage with a patient, but to engage with your team and support our team and not undermine everything that's going on with our team, creating distractions in an unhealthy work environment, you got to go. Yeah, and I think that's uh, and I think that is um, really um, fascinating as well because that really does um, require a level of fortitude and bravery on behalf of the organization. It does, and it and any anyone who's decided to have the leadership courage to <clears throat> start to work the process of you know exiting a bully from their department and or the organization has to really you know, comport with rule number one. Rule number one is you never take a bully on by yourself. You always have a consensus and a plan and, a, and a, an agreement, so to speak, of, a, of an approach with your administration and your human resources. That to take on a bully by yourself is probably going to be more detrimental to your career than theirs. You're the one that's probably going to be um, you know, uh, shown as the one who is now harassing somebody you're the one who's probably going to exit the organization before the bully actually exits the, the organization. Right. It takes a tremendous amount of dedication to um, doing the anecdotal notes and documenting all sorts of the behavior that's happening and the fact that the behavior is cyclical, regardless of this person's uh, you know, assurance that I've learned my lesson. Thank you for that training. I can do it better now. But it's very, it's very similar to... Um, violent behavior or abusive behavior, there's a, a bullying event and then there's a period of remorse and then there's a quiet period. Maybe they were over solicitous and then all of a sudden they start to get a little bit more irritated, a little more irritated. People actually try to placate them so something doesn't happen and the next thing you know, they bully again. And regardless of how much they assure you, I've got it together now, they can't. They cannot comply with any kind of promise to change. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and it's very interesting there also what you said about the fact that uh, uh, I think a lot of people sometimes it, it's avoided because, yeah, you have to do all of the, you know, you have to do the paperwork, you have to do the documentation, you have to do also all of this stuff. And sometimes I think, um, you know, let's be honest, people get lazy and sort of um, think, okay, well, I'll just try and deal with it. And then when the time comes, you don't have things properly documented and then uh, you kind of look silly. You do. Uh, and John, you know, the funny thing is, is, you know, aside from our beloved colleagues in behavioral health, most of us do not get enough training in aberrant behavior. So you mm. know, I, I'm an emergency department nurse by training. So, you know, if I said if I was in charge of the emergency department and said to a nurse, I've got three gunshot rooms over there or one person who's emotionally disturbed and acting out, which assignment do you want? So take sure. the gunshot rooms every time. <laughs> Or, you know, you can do something about that where we don't have the skill set right now, um, you know, by and large, as, as, as a population of professionals to really deal with the mental health issues, the, the disruptive behavioral issues, the issues that can be a little off-putting and make you fear for your own safety. And we, cannot, we don't have programs and protocols in place to make the caregiver feel safe in doing what they need to do. So that's a real opportunity for everybody to lean into training, but not just for patient care, training yeah. for understanding the disruptive behaviors that you're going to encounter as a leader when you go into any organization, but especially healthcare. Yeah, like I always said to people whenever they um, talk about going into management, I would say, you know, well, if, number one, I would say, why? 
why would you want to do that? Um, uh, and second off, then when it, if they still say they want to do it, I say, well, part of it is, you know, you have to, you're, you're part psychologist, you know, you're part parent at times, you're part all of these other things. But, to, and I just bring that up to, to your point, I do think the psychological aspect of it is something that all should be looked at from all leadership point of view, because I don't think it's not that personalities have become more complicated, but maybe they have, I don't know, but, um, but certainly it's very, it, it's, it doesn't be, it doesn't come naturally to most people to be able to read the psychology of people. That's true, especially when you're in healthcare and lives depend upon your attention to clinical details. <laughs> you're, you're kind of asking all things from one person. And, yeah. and all you need, and, and really this is what happens, you figure three to 5% of the staff, that's, that could come down to one staff member, maybe two, all right, who are really engaging in behavior that's creating an unhealthy workplace. You know, that, that's going to take about, you know, 75 to 80% of your time to manage two people. And you've got the rest of this, these folks who are really trying to give world-class care, and you're ignoring them because these folks take up so much of your time. That's why a coordinated effort between administration and human resource, a real plan that's going to be followed, and if not complied with, then, you know, you don't, you know, people don't get fired, you fire yourself kind of deal is the, real, the way that, you know, unfolds. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great place to to end here, because I, I, I think that's a, such a such a fascinating point such a fascinating point to make and it is it goes against and this happens in all in all industries but we spend most of our time working on the problem children and we ignore the people who are working really hard and it should be the opposite we should be spending our time helping the people who are performing to be even better and experience but still we go oh phyllis is doing an excellent job don't have to deal with phyllis i'm going to go over here and deal with the disruptive guy this is true this is squeaky wheel right squeaky yeah wheel. Absolutely. Well, listen, Phyllis, this has been great. The book is called Bringing Shadow Behavior into the Light of Day, uh, Understanding and Effectively Managing Bully and Incivility in Healthcare. I would encourage people in, in the healthcare uh, arena to certainly check this book out. All of Phyllis's information, including the link to the book, will be below this video. But before we go, uh, Phyllis, do you want to add anything about uh, who you are and what you do? So I am the uh, founder and president of M. FW Consultants, Michael Frank William, MFW Consultants. It's a full service um, uh, consulting firm. I do legal nurse consulting. I do a lot of legal consulting at, with healthcare organizations. And of course, I am a certified professional coach, certified by the International Coaching Federation. And I welcome anybody to visit my website. And if you do, if you go to the store tab, you can find a link to purchase the book. Excellent. All right, thanks again, Phyllis. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.